Okay, so here we are, and we're talking about independent events. This is the third lesson in our unit on probability and basically introducing those um, fundamental probability principles. Yeah. And we're looking at independent events. Now, what what is really, what is independent events? What's this all about? Okay, so we've, we've been looking mostly at events where we say, what's the probability of getting this? Or what's the probability of getting that? And what we want to do is we want to start creating compound events where you say, okay, what's the probability of getting this and then getting that one after the other? And in order to calculate compound events, we heard first have to sort of ask ourselves, well, you know, does the outcome of one event affect the outcome of the other? And so defining, you know, an independent event in this lesson, and we'll talk about dependent events in lesson four, being able to differentiate between them will help you figure out which calculations you need to perform. So there are lots of times when we're going to deal with two or more separate events. So for example, in your game that you're going to design, you may say, okay, so stage one, they flip a coin. And if they get heads, you know, then they're going to go over here and then they're going to roll a die. And if they roll even, then they win, right? And so you have to say to yourself, okay, well, does flipping a coin, you know, does, does the die know what the coin did or does the, the outcome of the coin affect what's going to happen on the die? And as long as it doesn't, you know, they're independent. And so these compound events where you want to do a few things in a row and you want to know what's the probability of this and this and this happening, that's a compound event. Okay. Yeah. Um, within the realm of compound events, there's, there's really two different things that we're going to look at. Actually, there's three different things that we're going to look at. The first two are independent events and then dependent events. And th those are the topics for the next two days, yeah. as you've just said. There's also another case, which is mutually exclusive events um, and non-mutually, but we're going to look at that lesson on five. Uh, lesson five. Yeah. So we're going to build this story of compound events. What happens if we want more than just the probability of one thing? Now we want to talk about the probability of multiple things happening yeah. within a probability experiment. And so um, to begin, we're going to look at probably the simplest case, which is independent events. So really the way that we define it is two events are said to be independent if the first event, A, has absolutely no effect on the second event, B, right? And so if A has no effect on B, then we call these events independent. Yeah. So here's an example. A coin is tossed four times and turns up heads each time. What is the probability that the fifth toss will be a heads? So... Here's our thought bubble, and this is really, um, when we show this thought bubble, this is kind of what we would like you to be thinking as you, as you do examples where you have compound events. Does the result of the fifth trial depend on, on the results of any of the four previous trials? And of course, in this case, the answer is no, right? Because flipping a coin, every single time you flip a coin, it's, it's like a fresh slate and you're starting again. Yeah. The coin has no memory, quote, unquote, memory of the past four trials. So every single toss is independent. And yeah. this, this keys into something that's very, very important. And it's, it's, one of the reasons, um, it's one of the reasons why gambling can be such a dangerous addiction. Yeah. And that's kind of the gambler's fallacy, which is that, um, you know, as you lose and lose and lose and lose you can't possibly walk away because you're due for a win yeah that notion that you can't be you can't lose for so long it's unlikely that you're going to lose over and over and over again and so they're waiting for that win they figure that yeah. win is that the next one they're more likely to win on the next draw because they've lost so many times but again whatever you're playing with has no memory of what it's done it it's has the same 50 yeah. 50 chance of turning up heads or tails as all the other times it, you know it's it's completely irrelevant and as you as you would see in in any game of chance is that most of the time you don't have a 50 50 chance of winning no. you know when you walk into um either a casino or um and of course chances are if you know if you're in high school you're not old enough to go into a casino but um if you're playing any game of chance most of the time there, it's not even a 50-50 chance that you're going close. to no, win. It's not a fair game. And so the whole point of this is, though, is that, you know, independent events, you know, those that are stacked one after the other, have no, you know, the next event, the next time you pull that crank on a slot machine or the next time you roll a dice or the next time, 
There is no memory of what's happened before. And so that's a, a very dangerous way of thinking that, you know, I've been losing for so long. I have to keep playing because my luck or, or the odds are about to change and they don't. Yeah. And so when you, when you go to a casino for the first time, look at the slot machines. And what you'll notice is there are people who, who are sitting there, who've been sitting there for hours losing. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to stand up because there are vultures behind them. Mm -hmm. And everybody's sharing the same fallacy, this gambler's fallacy, that if you're on a losing streak, that like the Something's next one's going to win. Yeah, and so your change. fear, if you're the one sitting at that slot machine, feeding yeah. all your money into it, is that you're going to stand up and some person is going to sit down and they're going to win yeah. the moment you stand up. And so that fear of, of your losing streak breaking, yeah. you know, just yeah. as you leave is so strong that people will, they will yeah. literally sit there for hours and hours and yeah. hours losing all their money. Yeah, it's very dangerous. And it's one very of the reasons why enough. gambling addictions are so real and so prevalent, um, you know, in North America and even across the world. Yeah. So here, um, back to the example, coins toss four times and turns up a head each time. So what's the probability that the fifth toss will be heads? Well, the probability of heads in any independent trial is one half. Yeah. So... Yes, it's a very simple answer, but really, even if miraculously you toss 100 heads in a row, the probability that you will toss a head on flip 101 is still 0 0.5. Yeah, it's still 50-50. Now, the probability in total, as, as we're about to see, of actually tossing 100 heads in a row is very low. It's so low, yeah. But it doesn't affect the individual probability of an individual trial. Yeah, it doesn't f affect that next one in line. Okay. Yeah. So here now, here's the product rule for independent events. Okay. A compound probability asks us to find the likelihood that event A and event B will occur. So like the fundamental counting principle that we use with permutations and combinations, compound probabilities can be found by multiplying. So again, the key word here is and. And of course, because this is the key word, yep. um, one of the definitions of this is that we're looking for multiplication. Yep. And notice the notation. We've got event A and event B, and the probability that you will complete event A and then event B can be found by just taking the probability yep. of event A and multiplying it by the probability of event B. Now, this is going to be very important because we've set up a system of notation in this course throughout the mathematics, and so now it becomes very important. You've wondered why we've been defining events all the way along. Yeah. Well, this is very important to define our events now um, and carry through with the proper notation. So here it is. A coin is flipped while a six-sided die is rolled. What's the probability of flipping heads and rolling a five in one single trial? Okay. So we have to ask ourselves, first of all, if we flip the coin and roll the die, is there any way that the outcome of the coin is going to have an effect on what the die is doing? And, and it the, won't. Yeah, the answer so is no. So these are independent, yeah. so we can use that formula, mm -hmm. PA and B equals PA times BB. So what we want to do is define our event. So we're going to say, let's let event A be the event of flipping heads. And you could just as easily make H that letter mm -hmm. just to make it easier mm -hmm. on yourself. And let's define event B as the event of rolling a five. Mm -hmm. And then we'll just find the separate probabilities, mm -hmm. right? So we know that the probability of flipping heads on a coin, a fair coin, is one out of two. Mm -hmm. And we know the probability of rolling a five on a six-sided die is one out of six. And so we use our good notation. We just say the probability of A and B happening is the probability of A times the probability of B, which will just be a half times a sixth, which is a twelfth. Yeah. Okay. So, so now we, we get into something um, a little bit different. A coin is tossed six times. What is the probability that all six tosses will be tails, right? So this is this we alluded to this when we looked at example number one, and we said, hey, you know, if you flip a coin a hundred times, the probability of actually flipping heads a hundred times in a row is, is really really small, and this is the reason why. If a coin is tossed six times, what's the probability all six tosses will be tails? Well, here the probability of a tail is one half, right? So the probability of a tail and a tail and a tail, and a tail, all the way to you get six tails, is the multiplication of a half times a half times a half six times. So basically for six tails in a row. So this is multiple events yep. happening in a row. And so basically what you get is one over two to the power of six, which is one over 64. Yep. So the probability of, of six tails in a row happening is 1 in 64, which is very, very small very probability. Yep. Right? 
Right. And it's like you, you're making choices at six stages. Stage one, you flip the coin. Stage two, you flip the coin. Stage three, you flip the coin. You know, okay. So this, these compound events sort of should remind you of making choices at stages, just like yep. the, the fundamental counting principle, except that now what we're counting is probabilities instead of just enumerating how many ways yeah. this can happen. Right? Yeah. All right, so here's example number four. A die is rolled and a card is drawn from a standard 52-card deck. What is the probability that a red face card will be drawn and a number greater than two will be rolled? Okay. So again, we want to ask ourselves the question, does rolling a two, you know, is that affected at all by what you pull out from the standard deck, right? Mm -hmm. And it, they're not. They're completely independent. So now we know we can use that notation mm -hmm. again. Yeah. So let's define our events. A is the event of a red face card. Okay. And B is the event of rolling a number greater than two. Okay, well, how many red face cards are there in a deck? Well, funny you should ask. Here they are. Uh -huh. King of hearts, king of diamonds, queen of hearts, queen of diamonds, jack of hearts, jack of diamonds. So those are the only red face cards in the deck. So there are only six of them. Okay. And in a card of 52, then, we could say that, well, the number of ways that we can draw a red face card is six. Yep. The number of ways that you can draw a card is 52. So the probability of drawing a red face is six and 52. Yep. Okay. Here are the here are the outcomes of a standard six-sided dice, one, two, three, four, five, six. And of course, a number greater than two, there are four numbers greater than two, a three, a four, a five, and a six. And so the probability of rolling a number greater than two is four and six. Yeah. So because these are independent, we can say that the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. And when we multiply these two things together, we get one in 13. So your chances are 1 in 13 of this happening. So now you can start to see some, some more examples because you're, you're going to prepare a game in the coming weeks. Yeah. And so now you're starting to see, okay, so now I can actually make my games interesting yeah. by using very, very simple manipulatives, either dice or cards or even spinners. Spinners, yeah. Um, yeah. Marbles. To, like, marbles yeah. To, to really say, okay, now I can stack things up and I have a way of calculating probabilities when I stack things up. Yeah. And note too that your players are more invested in a game um, that has multiple steps. Yeah. And especially if they feel that they can be successful at a lot yeah. of steps early on. Yeah. And so they stay there and play for a while. And even if they lose, they'll feel like they had a good time there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here's our fifth and final um, example. And this, this example is a little bit different because it, it doesn't deal with... Um, it doesn't deal with uh, game type mentality, but it's actually a very interesting um, sociocultural kind of example. And, and basically, it's kind of um, athletes being tested for steroids. And very often when athletes are tested for steroids, they are given um, a, series a series of tests, right? Because the probability that maybe one test and one test alone might miss is quite high. So... Here is um, here's an example where we have one test that has a 93% probability of giving accurate results. Yeah. A second test has an 87% probability of giving accurate results. So both tests are used on a sample that does contain steroids. What's the probability that neither test shows that steroids are present? Mm -hmm. So what's the probability that an, that an athlete who's used steroids will basically have both tests come up negative. Yeah, that they're going to get away with it, despite the fact yep. that it's being tested twice. So we have to think about a few things here. First of all, we know it does contain steroids. And so if neither test shows it, then that means both tests are wrong. That's right. And so what we need to think about, too, is, you know, like, how are we... How are we going to set this up? Because it, it is two events. We're going to administer mm -hmm. the first test, and then we're going to administer the second test. And we want to know the probability that the first test is wrong and the second test is wrong. And we've only been given probabilities that the tests are accurate. But since we know how to use the complement of an event, yes, we can also find the probability that they're inaccurate. So yeah. let's first define our events so we know what we're dealing with here. Let's make event A be the event that the first test is accurate, and B be the event that the second test is accurate. So we know the probability of A was given to us as 93% or 0.93. And then we know the probability of B is 87% or 0.87. But now we also, we want to know the probability they're wrong. So that means we okay. want PA prime and we want PB prime. Yeah, we so we want the complement. So the probability 
that test A would be wrong, which is PA prime, is of course just 1 minus 0 0.93, so 0 0.07. So there's a 7% yeah. chance that the first test would be wrong. Yeah. There's a, a 0 0.13 chance, or a 13% chance, that, that test number 2 would be wrong. Yeah. So, so this is very important, because what we want to do here is that we want to stack independent events, but we're not going to use the probability of A and the probability of D, B, because that's not what we're trying to answer in this question. We're trying to say, what's the probability that the first test is wrong and that the second test is wrong? Yeah. And we can even say to ourselves, well, you know, does the second test know what the first test did? Or, or does the outcome no. of the first test yeah. affect the second test? And it doesn't. So we know if we're finding the probability of A prime and B prime, then we can just use our, in, our formula mm -hmm. for independent events. So here we go. If we want the, the probability of, of A prime and B prime, then it's the probability of A prime times the probability of B prime. And so what we get when we multiply these two things out is, of course, a very, very small number, less than 1%. Right? So 0 0.91%. Um, and, and so what this tells us, this is a good result. So, you know, if, if, if an athlete is using steroids and they're tested um, with two tests that have these probabilities, it's less than a 1% chance that they're going to get away that with they're it. Get away with it. Yeah. And most of the time, these are very, very generous um, estimations of test accuracy. Most of the time, these are both up in kind of like the 90%, yeah. 90, 95% range. Yeah. Okay, so conversely then, what's the probability that both tests show that steroids are present? So both tests are correct. So the first yeah. test is right, and the second test is right. Okay, so when we do this, this now is the probability of A and B, right? So again, independent events. And so when we multiply these out together, we get 0 0.8091, which is about 81%. So now this is a very high probability that of course both tests will show that steroids present. Yeah. And but when you think about this in in terms of what we'd actually like to see, we don't ever necessarily when we're testing an athlete for steroids, we don't ever necessarily have to have both tests show. No, we just need at least one. We of just them. need at least one. So let's answer that next. What's the probability that at least one of the tests will detect steroids? Yeah. Okay, because that's really all we need. That's if, all we if need. one of the two tests shows that there's steroids there, then That's the enough. athlete is guilty of, of using of using illegal drugs. And note here that the words at least. Now we're friendly, we always italicize them for you. Yes. But at least, remember the implication when you see at least or at most is you've got some cases. Yeah. So there may be some desirable cases and there may yeah. be some undesirable cases. So here, basically what we're looking at is um, we're looking at what's the probability of A showing it but B not. Yeah, A being the only one that shows it. Or B showing it and A not, so B alone. Or the probability of A and B. Yeah. Okay. So the only case that isn't here is the probability that both are, both negative. are wrong. Yeah. yeah, both are wrong. Yeah. So what we need to do here is we need to do three cases. So here's case one, the probability that A is, is accurate and that B is, is not accurate. Case number two is the probability that A is not accurate and that B, B is. is. Yeah. And then the third case is what we just solved in part B, which is the probability of A and B. Yeah. Okay. So when we do these multiplications here, we get 0 0.93 times 0 0.13, which is 0 0.1209. Here's um, 0 0.07 times 0 0.87. And here's our last case, and of course we just solved for this in part B, so 0 0.8091. And so if we add these up, because remember, or is an invitation to use the additive counting principle, because these are all mutually exclusive events, and so we're going to use the additive counting event principle. Say, hey, what's the probability that at least one of the tests will detect the steroids? We get 0 0.1209 plus 0 0.0609 plus 0 0.8091 and we arrive at our result, 0 0.9909, which basically says that the probability that at least one of the tests will detect for steroids is about 99.1%. Yeah. Now, this we're going to leave for you to try on your own. You've got the answer. You've got the result. Try this using an indirect method. Because what we could say is, hey, what's the probability of case 1 plus case 2 plus case 3 plus the undesirable case? right? It should all add up to one. Yeah. 
So you try this using an indirect method, and our hint for that would be consider part A of this example yeah. and see what you get. See what you get.